I'm LaShawn Jefferson. I'm the Senior Executive Director here at Perry World House. And I wanted to obviously thank you all for joining us for this, this edition of The World Today, a weekly recurring program of Perry World House at the University of Pennsylvania. I hope everyone is safe and healthy and ready to begin what I know will be an extraordinary academic year for us here at Penn. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here today, uh, some for the first time, and I see some familiar faces in the audience, so there are also some returning guests. I'll do my formal introduction uh, in a moment, um, but before then, a few logistical notes, particularly for those of you who are online. Following the conversation, um, for those who are in person, we're gonna have Q&A as we always do at Perry World House events. Um, we ask that you line up to ask questions and there will be a way for you to do that sooner rather than later and I just have to find that way. Um, for those of you who are online, you'll see a chat button in front of you. That chat button is for technical issues and we're gonna drop resources into the chat button as the program um, proceeds. There's also a Q&A function, as you all now know online, who are on Zoom. Please use that to ask questions, and we will um, ensure that our guests are able to respond to them. Um, for those of you who are in person, please be sure to keep your questions succinct and have it be an actual question. So that's like question mark at the very end. Um, we also do closed captioning, and those uh, uh, um, um, instructions are online. And um, uh, finally, I would say that we are hope to be our, and are in fact a place of respect and learning. So to please approach this event and um, please frame your questions in a way that are about being respectful and about learning while we're here for the next hour. So formally and officially, welcome to today's edition of The World Today on digital assets and the future of global financial stability, which is co-sponsored by the Wharton School. Today's discussion examines the new challenges and opportunities these financial instruments pose for our global financial system. We'll learn more about how countries should respond to their new financial space, to this new financial space to assure consumer protection and global economic stability and national security, as well as how this might affect climate risks. I'm delighted to welcome the United States Commodity Futures Trading Commission Chairman, Russ Beenham to Perry Wald House, along with our moderator, Sarah Hammer, the Managing Director of the Stevens Center for Innovation and Finance and Senior Director of the Alternative Investment Program at the Wharton School. Before I turn the stage over to our, uh, for this discussion, let me say a little more about both our distinguished guests. Before assuming the chairmanship of the CFTC, Russ served as the CFTC Chairman and Commissioner. His arrival at the CFTC followed extensive experience in financial markets policy. As senior counsel to Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan, his major responsibilities included the implementation of the Dodd-Frank Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act and related policy matters affecting the Treasury Department, the US Prudential Regulators and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Sarah leads the Cypher Blockchain Accelerator and Cypher Digital Asset Incubator, as well as the Blockchain Laboratory at the Wharton School. She is also adjunct professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School, and previously she was acting deputy assistant secretary for financial institutions and director of the Office of Financial Institutions Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Sarah, it's my pleasure to turn the stage over to you. Thank you so much, LaShawn, and thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for joining us today. It's a great honor. I am thrilled to welcome you all today and thrilled to uh, be able to partner with Perry World House for this incredibly important event. Thank you to everyone from Perry World House who made today's event possible. And I have to say, I'm so excited to see so many esteemed uh, folks in our audience today and all of these wonderful students. Uh, as LaShawn mentioned, we are here to learn. And uh, we are so excited to launch our academic year with this incredibly important event. Um, so on behalf of all of us at Wharton and the Stevens Center for Innovation and Finance, Cypher Blockchain Accelerator and the Blockchain Laboratory, uh, it's a thrill to be here today. Uh, with all this happening in the world in financial services and financial innovation, I'm really excited about our topic today, digital assets and global financial stability. And I know that uh, we are going to touch on many important topics um, and your leadership, Mr. Chairman, in this space. Uh, but given the importance and the timeliness of this topic and the opening of our academic year, I'm especially thrilled uh, to be able to discuss these things with you today. So thank you for your leadership in this space. We'll talk a little bit more about that today, uh, but not only in financial markets, but also in consumer protection, um, in financial stability, in inclusion, and in climate 
uh, we are all grateful to have your leadership. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for joining us today. Thanks, Sarah. Um, great to be here, LaShawn. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, in the Perry World House, I also do want to recognize former colleagues, uh, Chairman Giancarlo and Commissioner Quintens. Um, it's a good indication of the strength of, uh, of camaraderie and bipartisanship we have at the CFTC. I'm going to just take a couple minutes and then we'll just pivot to the, the Q&A. But the couple minutes I want to spend on a little bit of a level set. Um, I'm sure for many of you in the audience, you're familiar and those virtually joining us uh, with the CFTC. But there may be a few who... Um, uh, don't know us or are not necessarily familiar with us. Um, and it's an interesting time to be chair of the CFTC um, for many reasons, least of which is the discussion we're going to have today about digital assets. But um, as Sarah said, we're the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and we oversee derivatives contracts. And those can be anything from agricultural derivatives to energy derivatives to metal derivatives to digital assets. Um, and, and we have this uh, significant constituency um, across many parts of the economy that affects the real economy and affects consumer prices and affects real people across the country. Um, and that is something that I take great pride in and I know my predecessors do as well and other commissioners have at the agency. Um, and it, it, it lays on a bit of weight on your shoulders because the markets that we regulate, the markets that we oversee to ensure their transparency, to ensure their fairness, to ensure those customer protections that you talked about, really affect individuals in their pocketbooks. Um, and in these times, and this is where you know I mentioned earlier, in extraordinary times where we're seeing massive disruption in technology uh, and market structure changing, which we see periodically every few decades, but this is certainly one of those inflection points. Um, obviously with the Russia invasion of Ukraine and agricultural markets and energy markets and even metal markets, the geopolitical landscape changing, not just in Eastern Europe and Russia, but in Asia as well and in the Americas, our markets at the CFTC become this critical node in ensuring price discovery and fairness and risk management. Um, and it can be anything from the largest manufacturers in the world to farmers and, farmers and ranchers who need to use our markets to manage risk, to be a producer of an agricultural product, to be a producer of an energy product, um, you need that, that confidence and that certainty uh, of both on the price discovery side and the risk management side in order to do your job. And without that confidence, it becomes very difficult. Um, and we're seeing that right now in our markets where you have such high volatility uh, and uncertainty because of geopolitical issues, because of economic uncertainty, because of inflation, because of any number of other things, um, that our markets are becoming challenging to participate in in many respects. And these are the types of things that I have to think about to ensure that markets are fair, they're efficient, uh, and they continue to serve the purpose that Congress intended them to do over 170 years ago. They've certainly evolved um, since they were first uh, developing back in Chicago in the mid 19th century. And now we see a, a full suite of products, again, from agricultural and energy to financial indices and, and digital assets. But the touch points across the real economy um, is remarkable. Um, and it, it think it, it puts a, a burden on me, one that I, I welcome, but a burden that I, I recognize is extremely important in these times of uncertain, not only for us here in the US, uh, but other global market participants. So um, we work very closely with our sister agencies, most notably the other market regulator in Washington, the SEC. But we certainly cl work closely with the banking regulators, the prudential regulators, the FDIC, the OCC, the Fed, and others. Um, and it's that teamwork, that, that collaboration that we have, which I think ensures um, a strong, resilient financial system, the strongest capital markets, the strongest derivatives markets, and ultimately, I think what makes our country the greatest and our financial system the greatest in the world. Uh, but in these times where we're seeing this technological disruption, which, again, presents risks, but many, many opportunities, we have to approach it with balance. We have to approach it um, with open eyes and ears. We have to listen. Um, and we have to use history as a compass for what could come in the future. Uh, there's certainly a lot of resistance, I think, from some parts of folks in the policy space uh, and across the economy about what this new technology is going to present, um, what is its purpose, and, and where might it lead. Uh, but regardless of that outcome, I think we have to, like we have done in the past collectively, um, think about it, discuss it like we're doing right now at the Perry World House, um, and come up with conclusions that are sensible, that are data-driven, so that if there is in fact something there 
um, we can embrace it, leverage it, and let it organically grow and potentially become a part of our economy, whether in the short term or the long term. And times that I've spent both with my colleagues, you know, going back to 2017, engaging uh, with market participants, with innovators, with investors, uh, with entrepreneurs, you know, it's pretty remarkable to see um, these ideas materialize um, from some very incubational points, even a few years ago, let alone five or 10 years ago, to the point where we are now, where we have incumbent crypto firms buying CFTC registered firms to, you know, gain access and to create products that are listed on our exchange. And just the proliferation of interest from both Congress, um, other agencies, international agencies, um, to understand and, and, and appreciate the role of derivatives and ultimately what this technology means for financial markets. So an extremely exciting time, one that, again, I'm, I'm very excited to, to be chair of the agency at this moment in time, one that I'm, you know, uh, essentially built off and working off the shoulders of my predecessors, but hopefully going to leave the agency in a, in a much better position as we think about, you know, this technology and what it's going to mean for our country, the financial system and the global economy, quite frankly, for decades to come. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I you mentioned extraordinary times and uh, we certainly feel privileged to be able to discuss those with you today and uh, have that discussion integrate into the work that we're doing here at the University of Pennsylvania. You also mentioned a burden, uh, and I know that we feel grateful to have you in this role to um, assume the leadership of that burden. So I'd like to take a step back uh, in our discussion to start out um, a bit about your background. And you've spent time in many distinguished roles before assuming the chairmanship at the CFTC um, both in roles at the CFTC, in the United States Senate, uh, in New Jersey, in the Office of the Attorney General, and in the private sector. How has your experience shaped your view uh, from where you sit now? Yeah, you know, I often um, think about um, my past, you know, 20 to 30 years and, and how I got here and um, some intentional, some inten unintentional, some accidental. Um, but uh, I was mentioning earlier, I grew up in, in northern New Jersey, um, practice, you know, went to law school, practice law. I was an equity trader for um, a, a bit after college and then found my way down to Washington and working in the Senate uh, for about seven years after the financial crisis. And um, the historical context of the CFTC are, I mentioned 170 years ago, our markets were agricultural based. Uh, we actually were a part of the USDA up until about 50 years ago, um, and part of my responsibility, in addition to in addition to dealing with financial services issue, um, was learning about agricultural policy. So, kid from northern New Jersey, um, you know, really didn't know much at all about agricultural policy. I get thrown into working on Capitol Hill, which is an all hands on deck environment. Um, and over the course of the six or seven years, fortunate to work for Senator Sabinow, traveling the country, talking to farmers and ranchers, thinking about farm policy, and really appreciating how food gets to our table, right? And the challenges that growers, producers have, the inputs, which we're seeing now with fertilizer prices, um, machinery, obviously the cost of financing goods, and I say all that because it gave me different perspective, right? So I had the benefit of working at the attorney general's office as an investigator, um, protecting New Jersey consumers. I had the benefit of working in the Senate and working on ag policy and, and financial uh, regulatory policy after the financial crisis. I worked on a trading desk and you know, vividly remember almost a, you know, 22 years ago, 21 years ago to the day, being on a trading desk, um, you know, on on September seventeenth, the the first day that markets were open after nine eleven, or when Alan, then Chairman Alan Greenspan cut rates unexpectedly, and seeing how markets react, all of these data points and all of these experiences, you know, influence the way you think. But ultimately, as I am now in this role um, in public service and have been for, you know, just about a decade over over a decade now, I've always thought the number one attribute, the number one um, role that a public service individual has is listening. Um, we all have natural biases. We all have learned biases from where we're from and what we learned from what we've done professionally. But 
we have this responsibility in, in the public service space to listen because we all have different vested interests, whether it's business or personal. We all come from different parts of the world and we have different experiences. And in financial markets where there are so many inputs and so many different perspectives, as with any other discipline, we have to listen, right? And we have to overcome those biases and understand that we have a responsibility to fulfill a mission, to protect individuals and customers, and to ensure markets are functioning. So I have to overcome that and I have to listen to everyone who, again, can be the farmer and rancher from Montana, it could be the large manufacturer from Michigan, or it could be the financial institution from Manhattan. But we have to understand and listen to each and hopefully come up with the best outcome. And that's the benefit of, I think, the work that I've done in the past 22 years. These are the benefits of having a commission um, you know, populated by intelligent, hardworking people who have different perspectives and hopefully using that friction of ideas and differences to come up with the best outcome. So these are the things that I, I am uh, hopeful and I believe have made me uh, good at my job, um, but really it comes down to listening and to understanding. And I would say for the students out there, you know, there's always traditional routes to take um, but I, I wouldn't call mine necessarily traditional, especially coming out of uh, UPenn, you have a lot of opportunities, but it's always good to, you know, take the sort of um, the, the unusual road and, and to take a different path, because I think it'll um, give, it'll instruct your future in many different ways that maybe your colleagues or your peers um, won't have that opportunity. Well, that's an amazing challenge to be listening in the role that you're in. Today, and as we were talking earlier about how uh, the markets are moving at light speed uh, with all the technological change that's happening today, and especially um, with the issue that we're here today to discuss, uh, digital assets. So um, as we all know, this is a space that uh, is incredibly fast moving. And uh, even today, there's some events taking place that will lead to some changes that we'll all be studying tonight and tomorrow. Uh, but certainly there are a lot of players and a lot of voices to listen to. And uh, it feels like an oversimplification to say that the regulatory framework on this issue is incredibly complex. And we have some work and some thinking to do and listening to do around that. Um, so Mr. Chairman, you uh, have taken leadership in this space and you recently announced the CFTC Office of Technology Innovation. And you have stated that the CFTC is thinking through ways to address crypto without new legislation necessarily. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? How does the CFTC work to keep markets safe through its existing authority? Yeah, you know, there's um, a sort of core answer to that question uh, is we have, as I mentioned earlier, um, direct oversight, direct authority to regulate derivatives contracts, right? Again, this could be anything from agricultural, energy, or, or digital assets. Um, Congress uh, was very thoughtful to give us authority over um, conduct that included fraud or manipulation, so anti-fraud or anti-manipulation authority in cash markets. So you can imagine if, and I'll just use a very basic example, um, uh, two counterparties you know, selling grain to each other, wheat, um, physical wheat. We do not regulate that contract, that exchange uh, between those two counterparties. That contract, however large or small, the pricing of that will be reflected in the futures price, which is what we do directly oversee. Um, Congress, again, like I said, provided us authority to oversee that cash transaction if there is fraud or manipulation. So it becomes a very powerful tool for us to um, sort of have a lens into cash markets where we otherwise don't have that authority. So Sarah, to answer your question, what have we done? And it's two sort of pronged response is we brought at this point, and this goes back to about 2014, nearly 60 enforcement cases in the digital asset space. Um, and these have been largely through this anti-fraud and anti-manipulation authority because we don't have authority in cash markets. But um, we've gotten whistleblower tips um, or information from outsiders saying, you know, you should check this issue out, you should check this individual out or this organization. A lot of this fraud and manipulation is very sort of stock Ponzi schemes, pump and dumps. Um, you know, uh, disruptive trading practices, things we typically see in traditional financial markets. 
but cases that we brought. And I think we've sent a very clear message to the public that you know we're a very strong cop on the beat. Um, we've also sent a very clear message to this community of, of individuals who feels it's okay to commit fraud and manipulation, take advantage of vulnerable communities and individuals and bring these cases. The other thing that we've done, um, and you mentioned the Office of Technology Innovation, um, I, I just reorganized uh, a, an office um, that Chairman Giancarlo started a few years ago, the Lab CFTC. And Lab CFTC was an, a tremendous idea. It served great purpose for the agency. It actually, in my view, sort of launched the agency globally uh, as a leader in this space uh, because we did a lot of wonderful things. But over the past few years, I've seen this evolution where lab, you know, what are the words you think of? You think about incubator, entrepreneur, startup. These are the types of things I think of when you, th you think of a lab. Um, we're past that point. You know, that was the right thing back in 2015, 16, 17, and 18. But we are now seeing this in real time. It is, it is real. And we don't, I don't think, have the, the benefit of, of just sort of having a discussion within a sandbox uh, environment. Um, whether it's the incumbent or the native crypto firms buying CFTC licensed firms or new products, new innovation, uh, just disruption happening. I felt like we needed to take it to the next step because our policy divisions are actually dealing with these policy questions right now. So the Office of Technology Innovation still very much focused on being forward thinking understanding how technology is going to disrupt our markets and what we can do as an agency to not only facilitate conversations, but help our other sister agencies, but also just be better prepared for the future wherever technology takes us, while the other policy divisions, and there are a number of them, um, are actively thinking about these issues. So we've been very focused on, on those few things. The other thing I'll end with is consumer education. Uh, we have, um, we're rebuilding our Office of Customer Education we're doing public advisories, things again, building off of what's done by my predecessors, but just making sure that the public has access to information via our website mostly um, to understand the risks associated with digital assets and to, to understand what the technology is to an extent <clears throat> so that they can make a more informed decision uh, for themselves. That's fantastic. Thank you. So, um... In addition to existing authorities, Mr. Chairman, you've also made some statements about legislative, a new legislative authorities, and you've discussed the challenges in the space going forward and how they continue to evolve, and that they're likely to extend beyond the confines or the of the Ex a Commodity Exchange Act as it currently is. So you have asked for legislative authority for the CFTC to regulate cash digital asset markets, the spot markets that uh, you discussed earlier, why do you feel that the CFTC is the appropriate regulator to regulate those spot markets? Yeah, um, so I think, and I've made this statement uh, or made this conclusion a number of times, I, I strongly believe we are the right regulator for cash, commodity, digital assets. Um, you know, we work very closely with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, I have no doubt that a number of tokens are securities, a number of tokens are commodities. I've said publicly that I think uh, Bitcoin and, and Ether are commodities. There are several other commodity tokens. Um, with our expertise in the commodity space, um, I think it's incumbent that, you know, as a country, and, and this has been my message to Congress as they think about this, that yet let's use this infrastructure that we have, this regulatory infrastructure, to leverage this expertise, to leverage the personnel we have at the agency um, to oversee this emerging market. Um, it is, it's a challenging issue where we are certainly, I think, um, becoming successful in terms of sending that message out. It's not, a, it's not an insignificant um, change for us. I, I, I understand that and I reflect on that. It's what I said, and Sarah, you mentioned this earlier. Um, for us to go to be a cash market regulator would be a significant change, but one that I am confident we, we can handle quite well given the personnel we have um, and with some additional resources and, and new hires, we can manage it. I would say that what it comes down to from a policy perspective is how do we want to treat these assets? Um, and I'll start in using the securities law as an example. The securities law, to put it as, as sort of high level as possible, was built about bridging gaps between issuers of securities and investors. Um, it's your large corporate who has a centralized management team that has audited financial statements. 
that has risk factors, management discussion and analysis, has forecasting for the future, has physical locations, all these uh, characteristics of a centralized entity that's controlled by a handful of centralized individuals from the CEO down to the CFO, the GC, and everyone in between. You don't have that need from a regulatory perspective when it comes to commodities. Um, I used this example a couple of times, I think going back now, probably three or four months, um, I think the Indian prime minister placed an embargo on wheat exports out of India. And this was a few months after the invasion of, of Ukraine. And you, know, you get the sort of geopolitical reason to protect you know, wheat markets and, and price stability within the sovereign state. Um, but the idea or the notion that I would put out a public disclosure relating to you know, a sovereign's decision to put an embargo on a commodity, it doesn't make sense. You don't have that asymmetry and in information between an issuer and investor. It's these, these assets within the commodity space are decentralized. And for us, it's about market integrity. It's about customer protections. It's about market transparency. And that's what we do best at the CFTC is provide the venue, the exchange, and every um, element from pre-trade transparency to the, the central limit order book, and then the post-trade reporting um, that's needed to, to have clarity from a regulator's perspective to create that transparency for a well-functioning uh, orderly market. And when it comes to digital asset commodities, that's what I feel that we are best positioned to provide as this emerging asset class continues to grow. And are there other authorities that you think the CFTC needs beyond supervision of the spot markets in order to regulate the space, Mr. Chairman? So I would, you know, I, I as much as the markets, the digital asset markets are so different than traditional commodity markets, the infrastructure is actually not very different. Um, and when I think about new authority and as Congress thinks about this, you know, naturally we would, uh, I think in, in my view, and I, I've said this, we would need authority to register the exchange, the venue itself. But you know, you would want authority over the dealers or the brokers. You want authority over the custodians. You would want authority over the data repositories. These are core infrastructure points of any natural marketplace. And these have been built over decades that I think uh, as crises occur and policy reactions occur, what do we need in that value chain from the investor making his or her decision to the final execution and settlement of that trade and reporting of that trade? What are those? What are those data points we need? What are those um, uh, components of the value chain we need? And in my view, a comprehensive, um, inclusive regulatory regime would would provide the CFTC with that authority. It's not reinventing the wheel by any means. Um, it's really using our experience and expertise, both from a policy perspective and as a market regulator, to say these digital assets are very different. There's no doubt about that. But the way they're traded, the way they're bought, the way they're sold. Those are the similarities that we can work off our experience and just rebuild that uh, as we think about regulation of the assets. Absolutely. So on that note, uh, comprehensive, you've made statements, Mr. Chairman, on uh, getting insight, comprehensive insight into the digital asset markets, which, as we all know, is extremely difficult uh, given the global nature of these markets, and um, that there is no single regulator or state or national government that has full insight into the markets. And to that extent, cooperation is necessary. So you and I were chatting earlier about how there are many places around the world where um, regulatory uh, provisions are being put in place. What extent, to what extent do you think cooperation is necessary in this space? Yeah, I mean, I just to be very clear, I think there's a lot of jurisdictions that are struggling with this. Some have been very successful. We're moving forward across Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Um, I think there is an element where we all need new authority because I think there's a discrete and distinguishable factors about the technology and the asset class that create uh, some legal burdens and barriers that um, could, could be well served by new legislative authority. Obviously, I've, I've outlined some from a US perspective, but the global nature, the sort of ubiquitous nature of the coins and the digital assets, um, the opportunities, I think, from a global economy perspective, in, in many respects, and this is another reason why I think the CFPC is very well positioned, um, we dealt with this after the financial crisis and the, the OTC derivatives markets, the swaps markets. Um, we are in, in very, very many respects a global regulator, more so than many of our other sister agencies. 
Um, and that is uh, a component and a trait that we have learned uh, and performed very well at for, for many, many years. And that's why I think we would uh, be well served to have uh, authority over these particular assets. But whether it's my work on IOSCO, the International um, Organization of Securities Commissions, or um, to an extent, the Financial Stability Board, um, this is a conversation that is front and center. And, and folks across the globe are thinking about coordination and harmonization. Um, we don't want to race to the bottom. Um, we want to ensure that jurisdictions are implementing somewhat comparable regulations. We know we can't get it exactly right. Everyone's going to have cultural differences or different opinions about policy, but we want to get um, the similarities uh, among the many jurisdictions close enough so that we don't have regulatory arbitrage happening and we have that sort of global harmonization, which will serve the market well. And I think it will serve financial stability and financial resilience uh, quite well. So an extremely important issue, and I would say one that regulators across the globe um, are not taking lightly. Um, we're working towards it. It is hard. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Um, and it takes time. But I think as we all incrementally move forward on policy, uh, some quicker than others, um, uh, we're going to hopefully get to an end place that is going to serve the market and then the global, global markets uh, well. So on that note, um, I'm going to skip to the big question. Since we have you here at Perry World House and our perspective is global, uh, and we're talking about globalization and global cooperation. Uh, so while we have you here, Mr. Chairman, we, we could not help but ask you the question, what is your view on whether digital assets are a threat to global financial stability? And I know that's a, of an oversimplified question, but we, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, I think about it from a very uh, quantitative standpoint at this point, uh, because so many of our markets can be measured in size, whether it's the derivatives markets and trillions of dollars in notional value or securities markets and trillions of dollars of um, you know, securities value. Uh, but right now, a number that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, market capitalization of digital assets um, just about a year ago, 10 months ago, was close to $3 trillion. Um, this was uh, correlated with Bitcoin probably in the high 60,000 range. Um, now, and I haven't checked the price lately, but in the 20, 000, low 20,000 range, um, and with a pretty tight correlation between BTC and the other coins, you're, you're seeing probably close to a trillion dollars. So um, significant uh, loss in value. But I said this, I think, in November when I was testifying in the Senate. Um, given the relative size of other markets, given historical perspective of 2008 and the financial crisis, what we experienced in 2020 with demand destruction across the commodity complex because of COVID, um, I don't see a market that's valued at a trillion dollars um, having a financial stability impact. That said, um, that should not give us uh, comfort um, or that should not... Um, push off the issue and the question because it's an extremely important one. And as we see the value fluctuate uh, rather quickly, um, we have to, as a policy community, as academics, um, as market participants, drop scenarios, right? And that's something at the CFTC we do very well. We work under scenario analysis, extreme but plausible scenarios. We do this with our clearing houses most notably because they're systemically important. But we have to draw scenarios about what happens if. So what happens if that market cap of digital assets goes to $10 trillion or $15 trillion or $20 trillion? Not suggesting it will, not knowing when it will, if it does. Point being is that let's draw these scenarios out. Let's do the math. Let's work off historical data. And then we have to start answering the questions. And in the likelihood, in the possibility of those scenarios happening, what do we need to do from a policy and a regulatory perspective to build the infrastructure and to be prepared so that if those prices do emerge and manifest, we'll be prepared at the time to implement rules or regulations um, or, or to caution activity by market participants so that we don't have a financial stability issue or a financial crisis. So this is why preparation and you know thinking about things ahead, we've, these were lessons from 2008 and crises before. Uh, but I think important things uh, to do right now. And, it, and it's easy because we have a lot going on in the world right now to 
to, to maybe not prioritize the financial stability question, but credit to um, the financial stability board and others. And here, you know, at the CFTC, we're certainly doing this is to build out those scenarios and be prepared for that situation. Absolutely. So um, on that note, things that are going on in the world, and we're going to move to questions shortly, but I, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, what you're doing in climate, Mr. Chairman, because it's another area that we're very focused on here at Penn and at Perry World House. Um, and with the CFT's leadership in not only markets, but also in energy and in agriculture, uh, in the war in Europe, and your leadership as well, um, we wanted to ask you a little bit about that. So in your testimony to the Senate in February, you had instructed the CFTC's Climate Risk Unit and Lab CFTC to examine the climate implications of digital assets. Uh, and um, this is a space where um, you have uh, spoken about the leadership of the CFTC going forward. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you took that step? Yeah, I, I think it's a pretty well-known um, narrative that um, mining activity, you know, specifically in, in, in Bitcoin, um, uh, it can lead to large energy consumption. Um, and I think not unlike Sarah, the question before, um, there's enough of a story, there's enough data to support it that we should look into it. We should examine it. I think given what's going on in the world with energy prices and some of the um, uh, potentially calamitous issues and scenarios that we might end up in uh, as we approach the winter, um, we have to understand and appreciate what type of energy usage is occurring for, for mining activity. Um, I have to give credit to the industry. Um, I've had a lot of conversations over many years, quite frankly, about this particular issue. There's um, a very significant and intentional effort to shift away um, from proof of work to proof of stake, um, to use different energy sources, renewable energy sources, and to reduce energy usage as it relates to mining. So I, I do want to give credit. I think there's a recognition of the issue um, and potentially a recognition of the dislocation between utility and, and um, the energy usage. So we're heading in a good direction, but I do think it's incumbent on regulators and policymakers to think about this issue. I've spoken to many members of Congress who are very um, supportive of digital assets and the opportunities it provides, but are concerned about this energy question. So um, instead of just reading a headline and, and taking it for what it's worth, let's do some homework, let's unpack those facts, um, let's ask the questions, let's listen to different constituencies and see what really is going on. Um, and if that disproportionality does exist, what can we do to provide um, information or disclosures to investors or participants to say, what can we do to change economic incentives and economic behavior? If there's not, in fact, uh, those things going on, then you know we've done our work and we can we can move on. But certainly, as I think about the technology where it is today, and some of the stats and, and the data that I've heard about energy usage, and and you know, as you pointed out, some of the work I've done in the climate space, this is something of you know great concern to me, and something that I think we have a responsibility to look into. Absolutely. So I would like to open it up for a few questions, and uh, we have questions both on Zoom and in person, it, it, I would like to invite the students to ask some questions. If you wouldn't mind standing up and going to the microphone. There's a microphone right here. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Raymond. I study international relations in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, so you mentioned that you believe CFTC is the right body to regulate digital assets. I suspect that there are many similarities between Bitcoin Ether and maybe other digital assets with commodities. Um, could you expand on how digital assets might be different um, from commodities and the necessary regulatory adjustments that would need to be made? Yeah, um, thanks. It's a good, good question. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, I think about, um, you know, we have cash settled contracts, uh, certainly, and mostly in the financial space. But some of the most notable differences, you know, with, are with our physical, physically settled contracts. And this really goes back to the history of the, the agency and what we've um, historically regulated. Uh, again, whether it's agricultural products or energy contracts, you talk about delivery locations, contract settlement specifications around the financial asset itself. 
I mean, these are these are the types of things that we're going to need to think about as we transition away from derivatives and futures and we settle on 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 this cash market. But the other element of that is, you know, this is going to be new territory for us. We we have not historically regulated a cash market. Um, so we're going to have to focus on that market infrastructure I talked about um, in providing that transparency around markets, but making sure that we have the pre-trade transparency, the execution of the transaction, and the settlement. Now, digital assets create a whole slew of different questions that we're going to have to answer about you know, ledgers and blockchains and how you actually uh, transmit or, or send the Bitcoin or the Ether or the other commodity from owner, from buyer to seller, or seller to buyer. Um, and those are certainly questions that we're, we're asking right now and thinking about as we uh, anticipate the possibility of Congress taking action in, in this space. But um, nothing that I have seen that's uh, um, unsurmountable um, and very different markets have emerged, right? I, I would say this about blockchain technology because a lot of folks have uh, come in to see me and said, you know, what role should the CFTC have on peer-to-peer -peer transactions? And I think some of the really innovative um, and and uh, breakthrough uh, technology around blockchain is, you know, making transactions simpler, making them uh, traceable um, and identifiable without, you know, I'll use the word bureaucracy of of some of the contractual relationships and agreements we have right now. Um, and that peer-to-peer -peer notion, the idea that we can just transact directly in a disintermediated way without an intermediated uh, in institution, whether it's in a financial transaction or a real estate transaction or anything in between, that's not our purview, right? That's not what we do. That's not what I think we should do. But um, some of the traditional marketplaces, which I know you all know the names uh, that have uh, emerged in the past five to 10 years and have um, rather large anchors as, as exchange platforms, these entities are performing the functions that we know well, that our regulated exchanges perform right now. And that's the space where I think you have customer signing on to an account to buy or sell a digital commodity. That individual as a customer should have the rights and the transparency that he or she uh, is afforded in traditional financial markets, whether it's securities or commodities. Hello, my name is Sean Bray. I am a uh, sophomore here at UPenn, um, and I'm also a native son of New Jersey. Um, and I bring that up because something I've noticed in New Jersey politics is that a lot of state legislators and even the governor are interested in crypto and making New Jersey a place for crypto to grow. Um, which means that they're interested in the regulation. I imagine this is a trend in other states as well. So how do you see states complicating or perhaps complementing the work of the federal government in regulating this area? Sean, I wasn't asked to talk about state politics, but I will, <laughs> especially New Jersey state. Uh, it is a great question. You never and, know what you'll get. With yeah, city no, I love it. It's a great, it's a fantastic question. Um, and quite frankly, states have been the leaders in, in this space. Uh, I will identify Senator Lummis from Wyoming. She's been a leader in the space. Um, others have uh, uh, sort of put a stake in the ground in trying to, and New York as well. DFS has been a leader in the space as well. Um, I would say, and this goes back, Sarah, to your earlier question about what I've learned. My first job out of law school was as an investigator at the state attorney general's office in Newark. Um, and as I think about that responsibility is about protecting customers, about protecting New Jersey investors. Um, it was about driving around the state and doing random examinations of broker dealers or investment advisors and, um, and, and bringing that level of transparency and credibility to, to, to markets so that investors in New Jersey would be aware. Um, there is a huge responsibility. And I think, um, uh, we in the federal government lean on our state partners so much across the board um, in our traditional markets, but in this market as well, to make sure that the ground level information is getting to individuals across local states and counties uh, and even towns. Um, and we have we have to make sure that we're using the resources we have in the federal government and that reach to make sure we're touching every state and every territory. Um, to ensure that that information is getting to them. Now, what I've taken caution with is there's been a number of approaches about um, 
Do we have a federal system of regulated exchanges and make it optional, or do we have a state uh, level um, um, option as well? I think markets function best um, at a national level. Um, I was talking about arbitrage on the international scale. I don't think we want arbitrage on a state by state scale. So it's a balance between leveraging the expertise um, and the power of the, the sort of union, so to speak, in the federal government in providing national markets, national transparency, but really using state regulators, state security regulators across all states and territories to leverage those relationships. And that was what I found the most empowering and essential as a state regulator was being on the ground and being and having that reach to local communities. And as you know, there's a lot of towns in New Jersey, right? And like getting out into each individual town and talking to a treasurer in the town or talking to individuals, doing a town hall in the mayor's office. Because as I've said earlier, not unlike any other financial uh, asset class, individuals will prey on the most vulnerable um, and the most in need individuals. And that has been the case. And you can look at our, our list of enforcement cases and it's the same thing that we've seen historically at the CFPC. So um, I think in my mind, it's working on customer education, consumer education, leveraging that investigative and enforcement authority that state regulators have specifically at the attorney general's offices um, and using that network to make sure that we can root out fraud, root out um, manipulation and get, you know, be the cop on the beat on the national level. But I will say at the end, it's important if we're going to see these markets emerge and grow and be successful, um, a national level market infrastructure is, is, is best suited in my view. But great question. Thanks. Thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed how you talked about listening first. Um, I was very impressed with that. My name is Patrick Lodoit. Um, I'm a freshman at Wharton. And I had a question more at a higher level, how you see cryptocurrency shifting. Uh, part of the core identity of cryptocurrencies has been this push on privacy and uh, this decentralization to allow for this privacy to happen. And as a regulator yourself or ch chairman, um, do you see that this privacy is slowly going to fade away as we try to push for more transparency and more anti-fraud, uh, banning accounts uh, from banks uh, for users uh, who are trying to set up marketplaces which don't have know your customer policies. Uh, do you feel the regulation is really going to come down on the anti-fraud and hence the reduction in privacy, which has been the core identity, I think? Yeah, I, thanks, Patrick. It's a good question. Um, this kind of goes to my point, uh, I think, towards the end of our, our Q and A, Sarah, about um, what our role is as a regulator, right? And it's that 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 analogy I used of you know a blockchain peer to peer transaction versus uh, a marketplace that facilitates the purchase and sale of a digital asset. And I think from a privacy perspective, um, when it comes to markets, you know, we deal with privacy issues and confidentiality and intellectual property all the time. Um, I think we do a very good job, not only at the CFTC, but within the US government to protect uh, you know, user information, confidentiality, and intellectual property. So there is a way to anonymize and to protect individuals' privacy. But I only say that in the context of markets, right? If the technology is going to continue to grow and emerge and afford opportunities for disintermediated or decentralized um, uh, economic activity or commerce, that's, that is one very different side of the story than setting up a marketplace where individuals can buy and sell a, a coin through an app on their phone. So I, I don't think it's, it's certainly not my role at the CFTC. Different question for different regulators across um, the, the policy sector. Obviously, you know, you mentioned AML and KYC. Um, a lot of work is being done by OFAC and FinCEN at the Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a balance um, as we see this technology grow and emerge to, to protect the privacy, to sort of preserve some of the initial um, attributes that I think uh, the entrepreneurs and innovators have found most beneficial to the technology. Um, but finding the balance with the way it integrates and um, interacts with the public, right? Because we, we, we do want to protect that privacy, but to an extent that there's wide reach or wide um, exposure to large groups of the public, vulnerable communities, um, you want that legal authority uh, to be able to penetrate some of those privacy walls to make sure that we can, you know, to your point and, and what you said, 
is to identify bad actors. Um, and I think, you know, Treasury has done a wonderful job. You think about the Colonial Pipeline incident now over a year ago, but we have the tools and we have to, you know, balance the policy pros and cons. It is an unresolved issue. Um, and it's a, it's a great area of study and discipline, I think, uh, and one that will continually evolve. But I do think that, uh, like other things, if we if we listen, we can find a right balance that you know allows the technology to emerge and and sort of uh, let some of the the attributes blossom, but also preserve those uh, legal rights and legal accountability uh, elements of our judicial system, which you know has made our economy, our country, and our financial markets the greatest in the world. Thank you very much. Hi, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for taking the time to share a little bit about how the CFTC thinks. Um, something I was really curious about was earlier this year, I think y'all approved the first event-based rules um, with call sheet. And I was just really curious what variables you consider when deciding whether to list or allow other exchanges to list novel types of derivatives or financial instruments. Yeah, um, another good question, one that I wasn't expecting to answer, but that's great. Um, I would say I, I'll I'll tell you when I I first met that entity um, and kudos to the the founders they're very smart young individuals um, and I remember and this goes back to 2018 maybe 2019 um, and the the premise of the meeting was you know going back to what I said at the very top of our discussion our markets were founded um, by agricultural producers, right? Agriculture was the engine of the American economy in the mid 19th century, certainly evolved during the industrial uh, revolution at the end of the century, and then continued to evolve into telecommunications and uh, electronics and um, manufacturing, and then obviously technology towards the end of the 20th century. So why should we limit the scope of um, risk management tools to uh, a limited set of commodities that is largely based on historical sort of legacy um, components of our economy, which has grown and evolved. Now, the markets evolved. I don't wanna suggest that the derivatives markets hasn't innovated and evolved. You know, we saw the largest sort of splash, I would say in the 70s when the, the CFTC broke off a USDA with currencies and, and financial indices and rates um, and then swaps eventually. But um, it is something that I think resonates in my mind and sticks in my mind. I'm not suggesting that that means it's a green light to just list whatever contract you have. Um, but I am open to the idea of um, contracts that have a, a different um, uh, characteristic than traditional commodity. So we're working with, you know, registrants and, and others are, are entering this market. I think mar this is a classic example of market disruption and technology where we all have phones and we can just download an app and participate in markets, right? So much has changed in the past couple of years, whereas 10 or 20 years ago, you had to call a broker and there were barriers along the way, right? Pros and cons to both. But um, I think it's important as regulators without drawing a conclusion or predetermining a conclusion that we remain open-minded to the idea of new listed contracts or new commodities being risk management tools for different components uh, of the economy, whether it's, you know, what we saw in 2020 with the pandemic and what risk that poses for a large restaurant entity, large healthcare provider, um, or a large manufacturer or consumers as well. So very, very tough policy questions and legal questions, things we're going through right now. Um, and I think you'll see more out of the CFTC in the next couple of months and years, uh, because we have to, our rules need to evolve. The law probably needs to evolve as well. Um, but I, you know, if nothing else, I think it's great to see young innovators and entrepreneurs think about a new generation of risk management tools, because I think it's important that we do that as well. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks. You can see Mr. Chairman, our, our young innovators here at the University of Pennsylvania are at the forefront of, yeah. of this thinking. Absolutely. And so I think we have time for one more question from Zoom. Is this a question yep. from Zoom? So thank you, Chairman and Dr. Hammer for this discussion. I have uh, two questions that are coming from our online audience and I'll throw them both at you and you can answer them um, if we have time, both of them. So the first question is, does the US government have enough power to pursue internationally anonymous criminals that steal digital assets? Is an international mechanism or platform needed that brings together many country actors? How might more international cooperation benefit, for instance, the Office of Technology and Innovation? That's the first question. And the second one, if price discovery at some point finds that the value of Bitcoin is the same as the value of tulips, 
what effect will that have on the financial system and who will be responsible for managing that impact? Thank you. I don't know if we have enough time left <laughs> to answer the, those questions about global cooperation and uh, yeah. full pricing of the digital assets markets. I'll try to do it quickly. Um, on the second question, tulips um, and tulip mania, you know, we've learned a lot in history and speculators and making sure our markets are fair and transparent and no one can corner markets. This is a hallmark of our markets, position limits and credibility and transparency. So um, this really, in my view, and I hope I'm addressing the question at least in part, but just another reason why we need a lens into this space. You know, um, I, I failed to mention this, but I, I, mean, I said we, we brought about 60 enforcement cases. Those cases have exclusively been brought to us in the sense that that information about that conduct had to be brought to us by someone on the outside. And it's because we don't have those traditional market tools, the surveillance tools, the oversight tools, the lens into the market itself trading uh, on a minute by minute, on a microsecond by microsecond um, basis. So as much as I'm proud about the work that we've done at the agency and by my predecessors, um, I've used this phrase, it's the tip of the iceberg. And I'm not trying to just go after everyone out there, but I'm just, you know, very, I feel comfortable in saying that there's a lot of fraud out there and there's um, enough opportunity without market regulators having those traditional tools and using data analytics and technology to, to, to root them out. So in terms of tulips and price discovery, those are the types of tools that I think we, we could use um, to prohibit bubbles and speculative bubbles and that, you know, the unfortunate back end of a bubble, the fallout and the, the pain that consumers and customers feel in their portfolios. The first question, uh, I felt like it was four questions, so I'll make it one, uh, was international coordination. Like we, with, within the US government, do we have the resources alone? No. I mean, there's no doubt about that, nor does any other sovereign nation or regulator across the globe. But this is why we work collectively and collaboratively together. We have um, great tools within the CFTC and other regulators about called equivalence or comparability. So I, I mentioned you know, level playing fields and avoiding regulatory arbitrage. We use our prudential tools. We use our market tools. We use our, our, our investigative tools through enforcement um, and leverage the relationships we have with allies and others to ensure that um, we're identifying bad actors and, and rooting out the fraud. And it, that is teamwork, that is collaboration, um, that is a unity and a singular vision in what we're trying to accomplish, which is you know lifting up economic activity, employment, and progress um, while you know reducing fraud, manipulation, and crime. So um, history has served us well. I think we've done a great job even in the recent past with 2008, um, and I have no doubt that we could we can do it again. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for joining us today and for answering all of these uh, very big questions. We are grateful for your time today and for your leadership, uh, not only here in the United States, but around the world in our global financial markets. I'd like to thank Perry Worldhouse for hosting us today for this important discussion and all of our distinguished guests for joining us and for the Wharton School for co-sponsoring this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. We might just, can, is this working? Can, can you all hear me? We might just never let you two go. Oh, yeah, no. another hour of programming. So ob obviously a deep, tremendous thanks um, from Perry World House for such an, an extraordinarily rich um, and informed discussion that was rooted in listening and in learning. And there were many, many points um, of, uh, that we can take away, but one of them really includes trade-offs and balances between what your office is trying to do the need for evolving um, risk management tools for, you know, for new commodities and future commodities, and the need for protection of people. Um, so there are many opportunities ahead for you all to come to this forum and to learn and to be a part of discussions just like this one. And I wanted to let you all know um, of a couple of opportunities ahead of you and urge those of you who are online, as well as those of you who are in the audience to go online and to sign up for them. So next Tuesday in the same space, uh, we will be having our global order colloquium that, um, Tom, can you stand up? Everyone can't see you online, but they will see you here. Uh, our program manager, Tom Shattuck uh, for our global order theme is organizing um, 
two days of exciting programming on a fracturing world, the future of globalization. This is a part of future, the future of globalization and a part of the fracturing world. So on Tuesday, September the 13th from four to five, please join us to hear from the former prime minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, and pins Michael E. Mann uh, to discuss how to make progress on climate change by tackling rampant disinformation and moving governments toward effective action. Um, our new president, Liz McGill, will be opening up that program, and you are all welcome once you RSVP. On Wednesday, we'll be joined uh, uh, by three ambassadors from Uruguay, Singapore, and the African Union to discuss how to navigate a fracturing economic order. Um, additionally, on Wednesday, we will have a keynote event um, uh, featuring the acclaimed journalist and author of Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World by Rana Furahar in conversation with Wharton's Dean, Erica James. Together, they will examine whether globalization has run its course, exploring whether operations, investment, and wealth should be kept closer to home. These events will be in person right here in the World Forum, as well as uh, live streamed on Zoom. You can always access the recordings of our programs and conversations on YouTube, and you can find out about all of our wonderful events that we've had planned for the rest of the semester by visiting us on our website, joining our mailing list, signing up through social media. There's a grab and go snack for those of you who want it in the student lounge behind you. But again, another round of applause for our wonderful guests.